by the wor world standards, uh, William Chatterton Dix, uh, in fact, I didn't even know his name until I actually started studying this. Um, he was a nobody, uh, obscure nobody. Uh, but that's typically who God uses, are nobodies. People that are obscure, people that came from Nowheresville. Uh, that was basically him. Uh, his father loved uh, poetry. Uh, and I wouldn't say that poetry is my main thing, but that's what his dad liked. And so he gave his love of poetry to his son. So he studied it uh, all through college. But um, after college, he became a, a, a marine insurance salesman back in the 1800s. Go figure. Um, and while he was a marine insur insurance salesman, he was uh, 25 years old with a lot of responsibility, doing really great, still writing poetry, uh, but wasn't a famous person or anything. But while he uh, was this successful insurance salesman, he got sick uh, and wound up flat on his back near death itself. Uh, and so while he's staring at his own mortality, he had a lot of time to think, as you would. And so he uh, had pretty much left his Christian faith in, in the dust as his career went uh, upward. And so when he got sick, uh, it caused him to reconsider his life. And so he went back and started analyzing his faith, reading the Bible, thinking about the things he had learned when he was younger. Uh, he started asking questions. Uh, and he started uh, writing poetry uh, in light of those questions that he asked as he faced death itself. Uh, one day, as he had a piece of paper in hand, he had a, a pen, and all of a sudden a poem hit him, and he just started writing. And he wrote, and he wrote, and he wrote, and he wrote. He wrote the whole thing uh, and finished, and he thought, well, what, what kind of title should I put on this? So the title that he put on that particular song was called The Manger Throne. That's what he called it. Uh, God uh, took this obscure man, uh, and took that song uh, from uh, the England area of the world and took it across the Atlantic and it wound up in the hands of Union soldiers and Confederate soldiers. And, and they loved to recite the, the poetry of that song um, on battlefields uh, because it gave them great assurance of who God is and that he was in control, etc. Uh, as that song was being passed around all the troops, uh, there was an Englishman who saw it who loved music. And he thought, well, that, that is an awesome song about Jesus. I think I'll set that song, that, those lyrics to a song. Uh, one of the most famous songs in England at the time, uh, in the 1800s, was Green Sleeves. It was a secular song. Uh, and so he thought, well, we'll take the secular song and we'll flip it and use it for God's purposes. That's, that's awesome. Uh, it's, it's like peaceful, e easy feeling by, who sang that? Who is it? The Eagles. I'm just saying, if you know, it's just taking that and kind of putting that to a theological motif. It's like a non-Christian can hear that and go, whoa, I didn't know that verse existed. You know what I'm saying? So, so what he did is he took this Greensleeves secular song, wedded it to this particular uh, song called The Major Throne, and those lyrics in that song came up with the song, What Child Is This? Because he took a statement, The Major Throne, and turned it into a question. Because isn't that what you want to know? Like at Christmas, like, really, what child is this? Uh, and so it was interesting how God took adversity to get his attention. And that's usually at how it happens for a person, right? Because none of us come into the world just pliable and easy. We all have a self-will, uh, and God has to kind of ring our bell, as it were, to get our attention to go, hey, have you considered? And, and so if you're not a Christian today, this, this sermon is for you. As you look around, like, what is Christmas all about? This, this particular song answers that question. If you are a Christian, it gives you all the information you need to lead someone to Christ, and also all the reasons why you want to worship Christ. So we're going to dig into this song. It's kind of fun exegeting a song because there's no Greek or Hebrew. So what do we do? <laughs> so we want to look at this. What child is this? That's the ultimate question of life, isn't it? That's the greatest question. What, what child is this? And so what I want to do with the verses that are here uh, is I want to focus our attention on verses 1 and 2. Uh, because as I analyze this structurally, verse 3 is merely a recap of what he sings about in verses 1 and 2. So you could uh, take uh, verse 3 as like the climax of the song. Uh, but verses 1 and 2 really get into the content of answering what child is this. So we want to look at uh, three answers that he gives you. Uh, not that I designed a three-part sermon. Oh my gosh, why can't they be four parts? Well, it's, there's only three parts there. Um, we have an analytical church. I'm anticipating you, by the way. So, so what child is this? Uh, well, number one, he's Jesus the Christ. Uh, this is what he says in his opening questions. He poses a couple questions. He says this, what child is this who laid to rest on Mary's lap is sleeping? Yeah, I want to know. Like, what child is that that has changed world history? He says, uh, what child is this whom angels greet with anthem sweet while shepherds watch are keeping? I mean, you think of all the babies ever born, what makes that particular baby so utterly important? 
I mean, what is it about that baby? Uh, that, that angels would stop all of their angelic duties, as busy as they are in the unseen world, and they would stop and focus on the birth of that one little child. Why would shepherds attending to sheep, and by the way, those particular shepherds near Bethlehem uh, only raised sheep for sacrifice at the temple. Did you know this? There's different kinds of shepherds. There's shepherds who raise shepherd, uh, the sheep for, for clothing, etc. There's shepherds who only raise sheep for sacrifice. So uh, Bethlehem... Uh, had what that was known as an area called the Migdal Eder in Hebrew. It, all they did was raise sacrificial sh- sheep. So what greater place for Jesus to be born than in Bethlehem, house of bread, near shepherds who only raised lambs for sacrifice in the temple, because who's he? He's the Lamb of God. I mean, it's, it's not my sermon, but it, you, can't, you can't help but talk about it, right? So what child is this? Well, these are the questions that he poses. So he answers the question, uh, in one statement, and which we'll spend the majority of our time analyzing this. But you're used to looking at one line and analyzing it for 30 minutes, correct? So what's new? What's the, so what's the answer? Who, what child is this? This, this is Christ the King. Christ the King. So notice, he, I, I'm sorry I have to do this, but he says this two times. Did you notice this? So if they do this in the scripture, this is, this is emphatic. If you uh, say things two times, and if you're married, you understand. <laughs> See? So this is last time I'm telling you. You tell to a high school student, right? Yeah, that, that type of thing. This, this is Christ the King. So he does this twice to emphasize who Jesus is. So what child is this? We first focus on the fact that he calls him Christ. He's Christ. Uh, highly significant. So Christ in the Greek text is Christos. Christos is a Greek version of the Old Testament, Missioch. Missioch is the name of which we get Messiah. That particular name means to be anointed. What does it mean to be anointed? Well, if you go back into the Old Testament and you look up the, that particular uh, lexical root, misiach, uh, to be anointed uh, means to be set apart. So I went through the Old Testament looking, you know, where does it occur that somebody was anointed by, by God's design? So, uh, well, the Holy Tabernacle, when they built it, according to Exodus 30, 26 to 29, every single thing in the tabernacle had to be anointed. Why? Because people are going to come worship God there. So everything had to have anointing oil put on it to set it apart for God's purposes. Uh, the priestly line of Aaron, logically. So if they're going to officiate as priest, guess what? They had to be anointed with oil. Why? To set them apart from that which is profane. Uh, kings, when they came along, First uh, Samuel 9.16 uh, says that the kings had to be anointed. Why? They are God's representative on earth. They're going to be set apart from other kings so there, God's Davidic kings must be anointed and smeared with the oil. The word uh, misiach means to smear, is what it means, like with oil. Well, then it applies to Christ, because he says here, this, this is Christ. Uh, think about this. Uh, Jesus is going to be uh, the anointed one. Now, I'm going to reach way back to the beginning of our study of the Psalms, which started last year. Remember? Psalm 2. Psalm 2, uh, the great messianic psalm, says in verse 1, this about the Messiah. The, the, David asks a question. He says, I really can't figure out, like, why are the nations in an uproar? And the people's devising a vain thing. The kings of the earth uh, take their stand, and the rulers take counsel together against who? Against the Lord and against his anointed. They're out of their minds. They actually think that they can create their own kingdoms on earth and totally rid themselves of God. And so what does what does, uh, the society do at large around the world? They try to divide totalitarian status powers that don't recognize God, and they think it's going to create utopia. And David looks down from the, why are they? This is a vain, vain thing. And they're doing this against God and against his anointed as they get rid of laws, rules, and regulations and put their laws in place of God's laws, etc. Uh, he says, this is, this is insanity. They're doing this against the anointed. The anointed there uh, is capitalized, correct? And the reason it's capitalized, that particular Messiah form, because this is not just an anointed Davidic king. This is the one, the main and only anointed king, which is going to be Jesus. He's the Messiah. Uh, David understood that. And so uh, when he says in verse 7, he says, let me explain to the kings of the earth, the politicians and the military officials, uh, if, you, you, you know, if you try to undercut God, uh, you're not going to win. Because when the anointed one shows up, that says in verse 7, it says, I will surely tell the decree of the Lord, he said to me, uh, to this Davidic king. Thou art my son, the father says, today I have begotten thee. Uh, the father says to the son, 
Ask of me, and I will surely give you the nations as thine inheritance, and the very ends of the earth as thy possession. Thou shalt break them, the political powers of the planet, with a rod of iron, and thou shalt shatter them like earthenware. This is the end of time. When Christ shows up, he's the king of kings, he's the Lord of lords, he's the Christ, he's the anointed one, set apart to, to oversee God's redemptive plan and his kingdom plan, uh, and he, he shows up as the Christ uh, to do everything that the Father told him to do. He's the Christ. What child is this? That's who he is. There were many anointed kings. Every Davidic king was known as a Messiah, an anointed king. But he's the main one. He's the final one. So you have to ask yourself, uh, based on the prophetic value of Psalm 2, concerning the anointed one, uh, was the world looking for him? It's a softball question. Yes, no, and it's not no. Thank you. Um, Matthew 2, let's, let's peruse the New Testament. Were they looking for him? Uh, Matthew 2. It says, when Herod, uh, the king, uh, heard it, you know, about, you know, these magi coming from the east to visit the, the baby Jesus, the king, uh, he was troubled because politicians don't like to lose their power. You understand this? Yeah. He was troubled and all of Jerusalem with him and gathering together all the chief priests and the scribes and the people, he began to inquire them where the who? The Christ. Notice the article before the word the He's the Christ. He's the anointed one par excellence was to be born. And they said to him, um, well, we have the answer to that. Um, he's supposed to be born in Bethlehem of Judea, for so it has been written by the prophet. Which prophet? Micah. Micah 5.2 says, he, well, the, the Messiah is supposed to be born in Bethlehem. Uh, well, we know how uh, Herod responded to that. He tried to eliminate all the little boys in Bethlehem, two years old and under, to get rid of his competition. But they, were all, they all knew. They were looking for the Messiah to come. John chapter 7, verse 31 says, But many of the multitude believed in him, and they were saying, When the Christ shall come, he will not perform more signs than those which this man has. Will he? I mean, they're like, look at this guy. Uh, Messiah is supposed to be born in what city? Bethlehem, etc. And also, Micah 5, 2 says he will be the eternal one born in Bethlehem. No kidding. Uh, but here it, here it says uh, the people are looking at the What miracles did he do? I mean, if he's God, you would expect that he could do a miracle, right? What was the first one? Water to wine at a wedding. Go figure. Best wine, they, I don't drink wine, but it's the best wine. I don't know if it was red, white, whatever it is. I don't know what it was. But the best wine they ever had at a wedding. And then he went on to heal blind people, lame people, raise dead people. I mean, just go down the list. So if people are watching all these miracles, and you would think they would ask this question. I mean, when the Messiah comes, they, he can't do more than this guy, right? So what's the answer to the question? Well, no. So who is he? Well, he's the anointed one. He's the Christ. Uh, John 10, verse 22. It says, And at the time of the Feast of Dedication that took place at Jerusalem, it was winter, and Jesus was walking in the temple in the portico of Solomon. It's on the south side of the temple. Uh, and the, uh, well, no, yeah. Uh, and the Jews therefore gathered around him. They were saying to him, question, uh, how long will you keep up this suspense? <laughs> I mean, we got to know. What's their question? I'm adding to the text, by the way. My Bible's not different than yours. I'm just, I read mine with a little more intensity. I'm thinking, if I was there, I'd be going, I gotta know. What's the question? Okay, if you are who? The Christ, not a Christ. I mean, could you just cut to the quick? Tell us plainly, plainly. Jesus has answered and said to them, well, I told you. <laughs> I told you. And if you don't believe me, well, the works that I do in my Father's name, these bear witness of me. What did he just tell them? What did, in simple English, I was Greek, but simple English, what did he tell them? They're asking, is it you? Are you the Christ? Uh, yeah, I told you. And if you don't believe my words, well, just look at what I'm able to do. Because only God could do the things I do. Follow the evidence. So are you a Christian because you check your brain at the door? No, no, I'm a Christian because I have a brain that God gave me, and I use it to evaluate the evidence to whether, what child is this? The Christ. What, is there evidence? Absolutely. Check out the evidence. That's what Jesus says. Check out the evidence. He's the Christ. They were waiting for him. John chapter 10, or 12, uh, verse 32. Uh, listen to this. He says, and, and, and I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men to myself. But he was saying this to indicate the kind of death that he was going to die. The multitude therefore answered and said to him, we've heard out of the law that the Christ is to remain forever um, how can you say the son of man must be lifted up? I mean, like, who is the son of man? Don't you find this kind of interesting? Wouldn't you like, ask, like to ask God a question? I would. The bad thing is you can't take your questions with you. 
You know, when you die, you leave them here. But hopefully I'll remember them when I go through the big, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How many angels can it dance? No, no, I mean, major questions. So they, they, they want to know, okay, we know that the Christ is coming. You say that you're the Christ, but we're not able to put our theology together that you're saying you're going to die, but the Christ is supposed to live forever. Hmm. Have you ever had an incongruity in your theological understanding of the Bible? Yeah. Who do you call? Who do I call? I mean, Lord, I can't bring these two things together. That's what they want to know because they rightly understood, yes, the Messiah is going to die, Isaiah 53. Yes, the Messiah will live forever because it says so in, in Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6 to 7, when it says that he will be the mighty God. And by the way, Isaiah 7 and 14 says he will be God with us. I mean, it doesn't get any clearer than that. Uh, they just couldn't wrap their minds around the fact that he was the Christ and the Christ had a mission of redemption. And that mission of redemption involved him dying and then picking his life up again and defeating sin and death. But he was the Christ, not a Christ, the Christ. So what does a little song ask? It asks the, the main question of all questions. Child is this. Well, he's the child that grew up to be a man that became the Christ. There's no other Christ. Who else is he? Well, there's more to that little sentence. Remember, we're still analyzing that first sentence of the song. Remember? It says, this, this is Christ the King. He's the King. Let's focus on that because we see that the article is there, correct? Are you with me or is it too early? I know it's hard doing grammatical analysis. Somebody uh, gave me a little uh, thing for my office at home. It's a little board. It's written on and it's colored and everything. And it says on there, I am secretly analyzing your grammar. <laughs> That's scary. Yeah. Yeah, this is as Christ the King. So the article is there. I would say it's like the par excellence use of the article. He's like the king. So is another king greater than Jesus? No, no. Like he is the king. So let's focus on the fact he was the Christ. Now it says he is the king. He's the king. Uh, the Davidic covenant, 2 Samuel chapter 7, uh, was given to David. And notice what it promises. Verse 12 of chapter 7 of Samuel. It says, when your days are complete, David, and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up for your descendant after you, who will come forth from you, and I will establish his kingdom, his Davidic kingdom. He, will, he shall build a house for my name, this is going to be Solomon, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom for how long? Forever. I will be a father to him, he will be a son to me. When he commits iniquity, because he would, because remember how many wives did he have? Like one too many. Um, I will correct him with the rod of men and with the strokes of sons of men because there's a penalty when you sin before God who's holy. But my loving kindness shall not depart from him as I took it away from Saul, whom I removed from before you. And your house, your Davidic house, and your kingdom shall endure for me oh, for a couple weeks. Forever. He's now said it more than one time. Your throne shall be established a couple months, a couple years. No, forever. So what did God promise David in the Davidic covenant? He promised him one. Uh, that, his, that he would have a regal posterity. Two, he promised that uh, the, the Davidic throne would be eternal. Three, he promised David that his kingdom would, would be established forever. He never told him, if you study history, he never told him that there's always going to be a Davidic king on the throne until the king of kings comes. He never said that. He just told them, no matter what happens in your line, no matter how I have to judge your line, I will never abandon the Davidic line because one day one is coming who will forever reign on that throne. Who's that going to be? Well, that's going to be Christ. He's going to be the king. But to be able to rule on the Davidic throne, he by definition had to be eternal, right? So that's what it says. Isaiah 9, verse 6 says this. It's a passage we all know. For a child will be born unto us, Isaiah says. A son will be given to us. And the government, the Davidic government, uh, will rest on his shoulders. Uh, what's his name? What's his name? Who, I mean, who is this one who's coming, this king? Well, uh, Isaiah says, when he comes, his name is going to be called Wonderful Counselor. One word in Hebrew. Uh, it really, no, sandwiched together. Uh, he'll be called the Mighty God, the Eternal Father, the Prince of Peace. Uh, what kind of empire will he have on the planet? Well, there will be no end to the increase of his government or of peace on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish and to uphold it with everything that the world doesn't have today, justice and righteousness, from then on and forevermore. And who's going to make this all happen? Well, it says the zeal of the Lord of hosts will, will accomplish this. God Almighty is going to bring his kingdom to the earth. And don't you see the world needs this right now? Because you can't vote in utopia, can you? 
Because just when you thought your party got in and now, ta-da, utopia, what happens? It heads to dystopia. It doesn't matter who gets voted in. Why? People are sinful. They're looking for the king of kings to arrive. So it, you know, he's coming. And who's he going to be when he comes? Well, he's going to be the wonderful counselor. What's that mean? Well, that means he's going to be the quintessential politician full of wisdom that you can ask him any complex question. Doesn't matter. He has the answer to it. I mean, talk about somebody who can think outside the box and it makes total logical sense. It's him. He's got the solution to everything that comes to him. He doesn't have to have boards and cabinets around him, does he? Does he need them? No, because he's the Lord. He's the Christ. He's the king. It also says that when he comes, he's going to be called mighty God. Uh, in the Hebrew text, it's El Gibor. Uh, El is God. Gibor is warrior. That's what it literally translates. He'll be the mighty warrior. Uh, I was just studying uh, Revelation 19 uh, this morning when I got up, um, you know, preparing for a future class on Sunday evenings at 630. Um, reminded of the fact that Jesus, when he comes back in Revelation 19, is El Gibor. He is the ultimate warrior because he's the only one equipped to deal with sin and evil and the devil himself. Why? Because he's the king of kings. So when you read about these great titles, they're amazing. Uh, talks to him, calls him the eternal father. Why? Because he's the eternal one. And he's a father to us as his children. Remember uh, Romans 8, you know, we cry out to him, Abba, Father to Jesus. You can call him Father because he's that eternal Father to you. Um, he's also able to bring peace. The very thing our world lacks and can't vote in and can't create enough laws to make peace, he brings peace. He has the power to do it. And he, when he does this, it says the end of his kingdom, no end. It's eternal. It's a Davidic empire because he promised to bring that eternal reign. I think about it. The older I get, the more I think about it. Do I look excited? <laughs> You're laughing. Yeah, this is me excited. Yeah, because I think about it all the time. Because I look at my old war-weary weary world and it has all the issues, the drugs, the dysfunctional families, the enemies, rising empires. Can't they just behave themselves and love their country, but they want to attack that country? I mean, I look at all the mess all my life, Cuban Missile Crisis, all the stuff I grew up with, and I, I just think there's got to be a king who comes and fixes all this. Well, then I got saved. And I'm like, there's answers. Because according to the little song, what child is this? He's the Christ, and he is, he's the king of kings. Man, what's really sad is he offered his kingdom to his people when he came. He offered it. How'd that go? What say you? These are softball questions. They're like, he's finally here. All the evidence. Let's worship him. Don't worry about Rome. We got this. No, that didn't happen. Uh, the parable of the banquet uh, tells you kind of what happened in Luke 14. When he offered the empire... To his people. It says in verse 16, Jesus, parabol para parabolically speaking, but uh, he said to him, there was a certain man, Jesus loves stories, because people who relate to stories. Uh, there was a certain man giving a big dinner, and he invited many. And at the dinner hour, he sent to his slave to say to those who had been invited, uh, come, everything is ready now. But, but they all alike began to make excuses. The first one said to him, uh, well, you know, I, I bought a piece of land, and I need to go out and, <laughs> isn't this lame? Did you see that? Look at it. What do you mean you didn't look at it when you bought it? Yeah, but, but you know, I've got to do it again. I kind of forgot what it looked like. Um, I, I bought, I bought a, grand a baby grand piano this week, a black Yamaha. I'm totally excited about it. I don't know where it's going to go. My wife's kind of wondering, like, what's happened to the furniture? But I keep thinking to myself, it's like, I've got to go back and look at the pictures that I took of it when I, when I bought it. Because, well, maybe I forgot what it looked like. So I go back and look. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. It's got keys. The most excuses if people don't want to show up for your dinner party are lame, right? Okay. Another one said to him, well, I, I bought five yoke of oxen, uh, and I'm going to try them out. Uh, please consider me excused. It's like, well, I just went to the dealership. I got a brand new car. I mean, it's got 1,200 horsepower. I'm going to go on 95 and just try it out. Uh, and, and another one said, I, well, I married a wife, and for that reason, I can't come. We're, new <laughs> We're newlyweds. Uh, and the slave came back and reported to his master, and then, you know, I, I can't get anybody to come. Then the head of the household became angry and said to his slave, okay, I've got a solution. Go out into the streets, into the lanes of the city, and bring in the poor and the crippled, the blind and the lame. I mean, just go out and invite anybody. Who's he talking about in the parable? Pretty simple to break it down. He's the king. Remember, Jesus is the Christ. He's the king. He's offering the Davidic kingdom to his people, right? He's offering it to them. What are they doing? We don't like you. 
we don't like what you look like. We don't like what you talk like. We don't like the things that you do. We don't like the fact that you take on the Pharisees. We don't like the fact that you address traditions that we hold dear that have got absolutely nothing to do with the Torah. But I mean, there's a lot about you we don't like, and so we're going to make excuses because we're not going to come to your big banquet. So what's, what's the banquet master do? And he's Jesus. Well, he's like, well, I, I got all this food. I mean, I, I'm in the table set, and I got to have people here. I love fellowship. So, you know, go ahead and invite anybody and everybody. So this would be like Jesus going from the, the Jews to the the goyim, the Gentiles, which also includes the Jews. And he goes out and invite anybody and everybody. You know, um, if you're a Gentile and you're a believer, aren't you glad he said go out and call anybody? Because he called me. When he could have said, I don't want you at my table. No, he said, I want you at my table. I mean, it's emotional, isn't it? I mean, I want you there. He wants you there. So he offered the kingdom, and the people made lame excuses. I just have one sidelight question. If you're not a Christian, and you're making lame excuses to not be part of the kingdom, why? Why? Because I can tell you, when you are barred from the kingdom in eternity, one question will rack your brain. Why did I say no to the king? The parable of the, the Minas in Luke chapter, 10, uh, chapter 19, verses 10 and following, uh, tells you what the king... Uh, expects of his subjects until his return because he offered the kingdom to his people they rejected it so then he offered it to the gentiles so now we're in this age of grace so we're, we're in between christ's first coming and his ascension and his second coming to establish the kingdom so in the abeyance period here what's he expect from people well he tells you luke 19 uh, for the son of man which is a code word from the book of daniel chapter 7 of the name of jesus for the son of man jesus has not come to seek and save that which was, uh, that which was lost. Has come to seek and to save that which was lost. He says, and while they were listening to these things, he went on to tell them another parable, another story. Because he was near Jerusalem, and they supposed that the kingdom of God was going to appear immediately. Well, they were wrong about that. He therefore said, well, there was a certain nobleman uh, who went to a distant country to receive a kingdom for himself and then to return. And he called 10 of his slaves, and he gave them 10 minas, and he said to them, do business with, business with this until I come back. But the citizens hated him and, he, and sent a delegation after him saying, we do not want this man to reign over us. And it came about that when he had returned after receiving the kingdom, the Davidic empire, uh, he ordered the, these slaves whom he had been given the money be called in order that he might know what business they had done. What's he tell you there? He tells you a lot. He says to the people, you rejected my Davidic kingdom offer I am the Christ, the anointed one. I am the king of kings. You're rejecting my offer. I will now graciously offer it to all mankind. But, uh, but I'm going to leave. And I'm going to go do some business with my father. And I'm going to get a kingdom, the Davidic Empire. And when he gives it to me and says it's now time to bring it to the earth, I'm going to come back. And when I come back, I'm going to settle scores with my people that I've left here to know, how'd you do with what I gave you to invest in my kingdom? Did you hear me? He's entrusted to you as his people different levels of responsibility and gifts and monies and all that he's given you, and he's going to want to know when he comes back, how did you do with what I entrusted to you? And then he's going to set up his kingdom. You know, I'm, I don't want to stand before him that day and go, Lord, that, I'm sorry, that trumpet caught me totally off guard. I mean, when, you know, when the angel blew, I was not ready. Don't you want to be ready? Don't you? I mean, I do. And when he comes back, don't you want to stand before him and just hear those words? Well done, good and faithful servant. If that's all he tells me, I'll, I'll be happy. Just well done, good and faithful servant. Enter now into the joy of the Lord. What joy? The kingdom, Matthew 25. It's the kingdom. Why? Because Jesus is the king of kings. So graciously now he's gone out into the highways and byways, and he's calling you to, to come to him because he's the king of kings. Now the last thing that we should notice in that little section is how should you respond if you know jesus well the song tells you this haste haste to bring him what laud that's a word you use every day <laughs> laud is that laud l-o-r-d laud l-a-u-d laud what does that mean what does it mean bring him praise adoration why he's the babe the son of mary but he wouldn't just stay a baby no he was the christ and he was the king and then the last thing that he was he's jesus the savior He's Jesus the Savior. Notice the second verse. Another question. Why lies he in such a mean estate where ox and the donkey, they're, they're feeding? 
Good Christians, uh, fear for sinners here, the silent word is pleading. Let's think about this. It says, nails, spear shall pierce him through. The cross bore, he be born for me, for you. Hail, hail, the word made flesh, the babe, the son of Mary. I mean, the opening question is, why in the world was he born in a smelly, dusty, noisy stable? If he's the Christ and he's the king, what is up with that? I mean, you would think, by definition of who he is, he'd be born in a palace, surrounded by attendants, trumpets playing and everything. Nah, yeah, what kind of noises were they listening to in a stable? Why are you so quiet now? These are easy questions. Donkeys, maybe there was a camel. They're very noisy, you know, goats. They eat everything in sight. <laughs> yeah, I've been near them before your coat starts disappearing through the fence. I mean, you know, well, why was he born in such a place, obscure place like that? Because it looked exactly where he was supposed to be born because he was a humble man, Isaiah 53. Uh, the prophet says uh, concerning the Christ who would come, he poses the question in uh, chapter 53, verse 1. He says, who's believed our message about this coming one? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he, speaking of the Messiah, he grew up before him like a tender shoot and like a root out of parched ground. What does he look like, the Messiah? Well, he has no stately form of majesty that we would look upon him, nor appearance that we should be attracted to him. I mean, He's not rippling muscle. We voted on him because he has a six-pack. Uh, no, no. He's got 18-inch bicep. No. What did he just tell you about the Messiah when he comes? Obscure, humble, meek, no stately form around him. Remember, why did they choose Saul as the king? Tall, dark, and handsome kind of guy. That's the great way to pick a politician. The better looking they are, the better the politician they are. no, no. We already know that because we live in D.C. We got the inside information, right? Okay, so no, that's, not, that, that's not good criteria. So why in the world was he born in a staple? Because he was supposed to be there because he was the humble, tender sacrifice. Remember, he's the Passover lamb born in the right place where they raised Passover lambs. He's the Passover lamb born in a little stable, the humble one. How should Christians respond uh, to all of this, Christ being born in that little humble place? Well, it says here, good Christians fear. For sinners here, the silent wor word is pleading. So he says to him in, in, his, in his poetry, as a Christian, you, you should fear or have reverence for sinners who are listening to the voice of God calling to them. What's he saying to them? I mean, if, think back when you weren't a Christian. What was, what was God saying to you? He's calling to you. Don't you know who I am? I mean, aren't you connecting the dots? Aren't you looking at the evidence? What are you waiting for? You know you're not, you've gone from thing to thing to thing. You still don't have joy. What are you doing? It's me you need. See what I mean? He, he says, as a Christian, have reverence because the, the Lord is calling out, like the good shepherd, John 10, he's calling out to the lost sheep and saying, you're lost, you know it, and I love you enough to call out to you. So Christians, be reverent so while well, the Lord calls to them. Uh, how does one become a member of the kingdom if you hear God's voice calling you? Well, he tells you in the song, nails, spear shall pierce him through, the cross be born for me and for you. He just told you how you become a Christian. You become a Christian when you recognize that he on the cross bore your sin. Nails from the Romans, those were your nails. The spear in his side to make sure he was dead, well, that spear was really meant for you. Why? Well, he didn't die for his sin, he died for your sin. How do I know that? Well, I read the New Testament. Hebrews 2 puts it this way. Verse 9, But we do not see him who was made a little, uh, for a little while lower than angels, namely Jesus, because of the suffering of the death crowned with glory and honor, that by the grace of God he might taste death for everyone. For it was fitting for him from whom all things and through whom are all things, and bringing many sons to glory to be the perfect author of their salvation through sufferings. This pretty much tells you everything you need to know. Who is Jesus? He is the Christ. He's the King of Kings. He's the Savior. He's the Savior. Jesus, the, he the Greek word, Jesus, is from the Hebrew word, Yasha or Yeshua. Yasha means to save. He's not a Savior. He's the Savior. Why? Well, he, he came to taste death for everyone. Your sin, not his, so that he might do what? Lead many sons to glory and daughters as well. When he comes, are you going to be in that line of people walking with him into glory? That's an exciting proposition. What babe is this? 
He's the Christ. He's the King of Kings. He's the Savior. Question is, is he your Savior? If he's your Savior, I can tell you what you should sing because it's at the end of this little song. He tells you this. Hail, hail, the Word made flesh, the babe, the son of Mary. As a Christian, I bow before him and tell him, Lord, you are the Lord, and I worship you. What's he waiting for you to do this Christmas? To come to him in faith. I want to introduce you to something I find most interesting. Um, there's an old heavy metal group. Uh, five Finger Death Punch. I know, I like heavy metal. Just go with it. Yeah, they look really Christian, don't they? <laughs> they have a song that I was listening to the other day. I'm like, wow. It's called Wash It All Away. Here's the first verse. I've given up on society, up on my family, up on social disease. I've given up on the industry, up on democracy, done with all of your hypocrisy. I've given up on all the chaos and all of the lies I hated. I'm wasting here. And then he says, screaming into the microphone, can anyone wash it away? <laughs> he says, I'm waiting here for anyone to wash it all away, wash it all away. I'm waiting here. I was listening to this hard driving heavy metal tune and I just sat at my desk and I'm like, that's the world. They don't have a clue. He's asking you, would somebody please show up and just wash this away? And I'm thinking, what's his number? <laughs> I got the answer. Because what child is this? Test time. Who is he? He's the Christ. He's the King of Kings. And he's the Savior. And he came to save people like that. He came to save you. Let's pray. God, thank you that you give us the answer to this, the question that the lost person cries. Uh, they're just looking for someone to wash away the pain and the woe and the dysfunction and the sin and the evil. And you're standing right there with all the answers because you are the Christ, the King, and the Savior. Uh, might that group come to know you? Uh, might many people that uh, know them come to know you because of their witness? And might we be a great witness of the three things that explain who you are to those in our families that don't know you? And for those that are either here or online today that finally have had a spiritual aha moment, might they this day bow before you, the King of Kings, and be saved. Amen. And Merry Christmas to you.